I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of all of the lands on which we meet today and the important wisdom shared throughout their continued connection with the land, waters and community. We respectfully recognise the elders of the past and present and walk with the children who will become future elders. Thanks for dialing in today, everyone. Um, we look forward to your thoughts, input and discussion to try and improve the system for children and their families in the bush. In particular, I'd love to thank the partners and friends that we work with at Royal Far Western Community for joining the call. As I said, lots of familiar faces online. I am the new CEO of Royal Far West. And for those of you that don't know us, we have been supporting the health and well-being of country children for almost a hundred years. We are a private charity that offers health, education and disability services, and we are thrilled to be partnering with Thrive by Five on this round table. It's also great to see so many early educators, health workers and important stakeholders in this area on the call. And it really is um, an honour to have the New South Wales Minister for Education and Early Childhood Learning, the Honourable Sarah Mitchell, on our panel today, who is also joined by Jay Weatherall, the former Premier of South Australia. Welcome, Jay. Hello. Um, and now CEO of Thrive by Five. We also have joining us Dr. Marcel Zimmet, um, Royal Far West Zone Specialist Developmental Paediatrician, and Councillor Barbara Newton, um, again, a, a great friend of Royal Far West, Deputy Mayor of Parks in New South Wales, and Karen Russell, the National Manager for Early Years in Government Programs from Smith Family. So just some housekeeping issues before we begin. We'll be saving questions and comments until the end of the panel, but it is really important that we hear from you today. So you will be muted during the session unless you wish to ask a question. If you do have a question or in fact a comment or want to share your story, please put it in the chat function and I'll try and call on as many of you as possible, time permitting. Okay, so why are we doing this virtual roundtable today? Well, we believe that all children deserve access to quality early learning and childcare. Where they live should not be a barrier to this, but at RFW, we know only too well that in rural and re remote Australia, the range and number of services that are available to young children is significantly less in comparison to those available in metro areas. We also know that children living in rural and remote areas of Australia are twice as likely to start school developmentally vulnerable than city children such as geographical isolation and a lack of early intervention services. These challenges are often not picked up until a child is well into their first or second year of school or even later. By this time, it's quite common for them to be labelled the naughty kid. The importance of early learning and childcare in addressing developmental vulnerabilities is key. It's all about early intervention and picking up challenges before children start school. Children who are already falling behind in the first few years of their childhood face greater obstacles to catch up and succeed at school and beyond. The 2018 Australian Early Development Census figures show that one in five children across rural and remote areas are vulnerable on two or more of the following developmental domains, physical health and wellbeing, social competence, emotional maturity, language and cognitive skills, communication skills and general knowledge. This compares to one in 10 children in metro areas. It also tells us that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children are twice as likely as non-Indigenous children to be developmental vulner developmentally vulnerable. There are far few early learning and childcare providers in rural and remote areas, that's just a fact. So access to these services is going to be key. Equally, more children, as I've mentioned, in rural and remote areas will be turning up to preschool, even if we solve the access problem with developmental challenges. So it's really important that early learning educators in these areas um, will need more support to provide the levels of quality care that will make a difference in a child's early years. Reform of the early learning system is vital to support children in rural and remote areas to be able to learn, grow and thrive. Common feedback that we hear at Royal Far West through the work we do supporting country children with developmental challenges is that one of the biggest barriers for families accessing affordable high quality childcare 
actually stems from a lack of understanding of the importance of early childhood development. And that of course is exacerbated by the lack of access to quality services or an inability to afford to send their children to care. So time is short. So let's start by welcoming New South Wales Minister for Education and Early Childhood Learning, the Honourable Sarah Mitchell, who will talk about brighter beginnings the New South Wales government policy for the first 2000 days. It is a great pleasure to have the Minister online today. Um, thank you for joining us. Thank you. Thanks, Jackie. Uh, well, good afternoon, everybody. Just checking you can all hear me okay before I start. Yep, nods, that's good. It's something I've learned in the many Zoom and Teams meetings we've had, just to make sure you're online before you start chatting. Uh, I also just want to, uh, of course, acknowledge the traditional owners of all the lands that we're meeting on today. I'm at home in Gunnada, uh, so I'm on Gamilaroi land and I pay my respect to elders past and present and emerging. Uh, look, Jackie, thank you to you for uh, organising this uh, roundtable in partnership with Thrive by Five and I'll acknowledge Jay as well. Uh, I think it's a great opportunity to come together and start to have some, some conversations around what work we're doing, but also what more we can do together. Uh, I'll also say um, just uh, at the beginning, as I said, I'm, I'm working from home like so many of us are. I have an eight-year-old and a three-year-old. Some of you would already be aware of that. My eight-year-old is pretty good at letting mum have meetings. My three-year-old has a tendency to make cameo appearances. So uh, if Matilda pops up on screen, I, I'll apologise. But I think in this forum, it's probably very fitting to have a three-year-old uh, involving herself. Um, so I guess a couple of things that I'd like to, to, to say, uh, obviously there's a bit going on in, in New South Wales and in education at the moment. I hope to be here for as long as I can, but if I do end up not being able to stay for the whole meeting, I'm sure you would forgive me for that. Um, but I think this is a, a, an important uh, time to be having this conversation around what we're doing in the early years, particularly for our rural and remote communities. Um, for me, as someone born and raised in Canada, raising my family, uh, I've been in the ministry now for about four and a half years. I've had early childhood for that entire time and then education for the last couple of years. And I think just picking up on a point that you made, Jackie, it's so important that we help our children start school in the best possible way. Uh, and that work that we do in the first five years is just critical. So of all the different things that we've been doing since I've been in government, I have to say, I'm actually most excited by this Brighter Beginnings initiative. Some of you will already be familiar with it, uh, but effectively what we're doing is bringing together all of our government agencies. Uh, I'm leading it as the minister because it's something that I'm incredibly passionate about in terms of public policy and outcomes. Uh, but it's about bringing education, health, customer service, uh, Department of Communities and Justice, everyone to the table saying, what do we need to do in our communities to really help our children in those first 2000 days of life? So there's a real synergy, I think, with the work that Royal Far West does, but also uh, with the work of Thrive by Five and the Mindaroo Foundation. I think it's timely uh, that we're looking at how we can work together. There's a few different initiatives that we want to do under Brighter Beginnings, um, ranging from everything from, you know, uh, what we can put online in terms of digital services, how we better support parents through that journey, particularly those first few years uh, in the early childhood space, making sure they understand how important early childhood services are and the benefits of making sure uh, that your children have access to those. Uh, and then, of course, all of the, the various health requirements and, and health benefits that we know we need to support families in. I think one of the key areas that has been, obviously for us, in the early childhood space, our Start Strong funding rollout, uh, looking at what we can do to support our early childhood services. Uh, earlier this year, we launched our, our new First Step strategy, which is working particularly with services around uh, engagement for Aboriginal children and families in early childhood education. Again, very, very important. Uh, but there's a lot of work that can come together and I think under Brighter Beginnings really uh, see improvements that, that all of us want uh, in a way that we haven't done in government before. It's about trying to break down those silos that despite the best intentions do tend to exist between government agencies and people working in different fields where we really should be a bit more collaborative and that's exactly what we want to do with Brighter Beginnings. Um, I think also too uh, going forward we've been really open so far and, and there's more work to do but certainly with our early childhood stakeholders what else is there that we can do that maybe we aren't doing now. Um, I know that there's a, a lot of friends and familiar faces in the sector 
structure on this call. Uh, just, just as one example, we, um, we're working with some services in Dubbo around particularly access to allied health and that early intervention and support, saying to the sector, let us know, how would it work in your community? Is that something we can pilot? Can we scale it up? Uh, we've had really good interactions with the group in Dubbo so far. Uh, I'm also keen to look at what we can do around some of our preschool provision and early childhood provision in our more remote communities. We've started that with a community safety net program, but it's been running for a few years. It's been a little slow, and I think we need to rethink how that works. Uh, and I'll acknowledge, I know some of the, the representatives from organisations like the ICPA, who I know are on the call. Again, they're, they're being really proactive with different community ideas that will work. And, and I think under Brighter Beginnings, it gives us a real pathway uh, to look at how we bring services together better, how we get the funding and resources that we need to support our families, but really all with that same goal uh, that everyone on this call has, which is how do we uh, reduce the number of kids that are development, developmental, developmentally vulnerable before they start school? How are we best preparing all of our young people uh, to start school in the best possible place? And, and for me as Education Minister, um, that's 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 the goal. That's what we want. We want them to be able to walk into school gate on the first day of kindergarten, absolutely ready, rearing, uh, willing to, to to do all that learning that we know they're going to do, and that we've helped with that early intervention and targeted support earlier. So, um, look, I'll, I'll stop there, Jackie. Again, thank you for the opportunity. Really, really keen to hear from the other speakers today, but also hear questions and feedback from others on the panel. And I hope that this will be uh, not just the start, but a continuing and ongoing conversation and partnership as we all work for the same outcome, which is, is the best start in life for our young people in uh, rural and remote New South Wales. So, thank you. Thank you so much, Minister. That's just so fantastic to hear what you've had to say. Um, it sounds like lots of great um, starts, uh, lots of great beginnings, as you say, um, and really thrilled to hear that there's some allied health supports um, going into this area um, because it, it's definitely needed. And also the, the breaking down the silos um, is just so, it's so crucial to actually getting better outcomes for, for children and families. Um, thanks again. I'll pass on now um, to Jay Weddell, CEO of Thrive by Five. Thank you, Jay, for joining us. Thank you very much, Jackie. And uh, can I first acknowledge that uh, I'm coming to you from, from Perth, for the Wadjuk Noongar country. And can I also acknowledge the minister and thank you for that, that presentation. Uh, brighter beginning sounds like the sort of system reform that we want to see across the whole of the country. Uh, service integration across all of these different domains. Um, and for me, it's a little bit of history repeating itself because uh, when I was Minister for Education, I was working closely with another National Party New South Wales Minister called Adrian Piccoli, who was working with us very closely as we were uh, really on, a, on the same page, trying to get the Commonwealth to um, uh, put some more resources into the Gonski funding. And I don't think it's any accident that you actually saw you know, Labor Minister for Education and National Party Minister for Education on the same page on these issues. Because I think what people in the bush understand is that um, all of these issues around service delivery are much more acute when it comes to rural and regional areas. And so there is, a, there is common ground, I think, that can be had between uh, various parts of the political process. Um, Look, it's, it's unarguable that the first five years are crucial for everything that follows. Um, but what we have at the moment is a service system that, that doesn't actually support that. It, that. We don't behave as though that's true. Uh, we have a whole lot of mismatch of uh, arrangements scattered across a whole range of, of agencies. And the big, if you like, the big missing piece is the bit in the middle. So we've got pretty good infant and maternal services, pretty good preschool few bits and pieces that need to be sorted out there. But really the hole in the middle is childcare. And childcare is a Commonwealth funded and supervised program, but it doesn't, um, and, and while it's over time has, has had more of a focus on early learning, it's still very much uh, a model which is based on uh, workforce participation. And what we need to do is to create a system which is more akin to an early learning system and, and something that looks more like our education system. So just imagine a world where zero to five was a sort of system that we sort of see in school. 
age-based appropriate play-based early learning, but something that you could rely upon, not something that was just rationed out according to, to income or having to jump through all of these tests or having to rely upon market provision, which often fails in rural and regional areas. If we had a coherent zero to five system across the nation, uh, obviously looking different depending on the places that it, that it looked like, uh, that it was operating in, uh, it could make such a profound difference to the health and well-being of our children now and in the future. So that's, that's our vision. And I think the way we want to achieve it is many voices, like the voices we see around this room, but one message. If we can all raise our voice uh, and actually call for this, whether it's you know, people stretching across the aisle in terms of National Party, Labor Party, Greens, you name it. If everybody actually raises their voices, uh, we can actually be successful in achieving this. Nobody seeks to defend the current system. Nobody thinks that our current early years system is a good one. The only argument that's faintly raised against it is that it's too expensive to fix. But all the evidence suggests that this would pay for itself, this reform. So even that argument doesn't work. It doesn't matter which way you look, whether it's about the way in which a child's brain develops, cost of living pressures on young families, workforce participation for, for the second income earner, usually the woman, or, or whether you're looking at the economy more generally and just building our capability, or just looking at the health and well-being of, of our children or to try and resolve disadvantage. Everywhere you look, there are great arguments in favour of this reform. So from bitter experience, I've also found that having a good argument is not enough. And I think Sarah would back me up in this. You need more than a good argument. You need strength. You need political weight. Uh, and so that's what, that's what really today is about, is to mobilise, to get a movement for change. Uh, and, you know, the, uh, this, this government nationally relies upon, is in coalition with the National Party, uh, so rural and regional people can make a difference to this campaign. So that's why we're trying to get people to raise their voice uh, and to join the thrivebyfive.org.au. So go to that website, register as a supporter, and any pressure you can bring to bear on the political process will allow us to get the reform that we need. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jay. I, I have to say that since Royal Far West, um, has become a campaign partner in Thrive by Five um, and this initiative. We we have just been, um, you know, really excited by the the mechanism or the power of building such a strong coalition. And every week that we attend, we see more and more more partners coming into this and and giving a voice. And ultimately, um, you know, Jay completely agree with you that it's only going to be through the many voices. And I know with so many of the faces I see on on this line, it's, it's, we are preaching to the converted. All of you know these issues and understand them well. And, and so, um, you know, I join in that chorus really of, of um, uh, recommending that you all join the campaign, you join up as supporters, um, and we really try to make this change um, for the kids. Okay, thank you, Jay, again. Um, I'll now, I've got great pleasure actually now in introducing, introducing you to Dr. Marcel Himmert. Um, Marcel is um, a dental paediatrician. He has been with Royal Far West for quite some years now. And, you know, he sees the, the um, really the impact that not intervening early um, or challenges of their healthy development, um, what impact that makes um, for children uh, in the middle years and then later on. And um, uh, Marcel, really pleased to have you on the line today. Thanks so much, uh, Jackie, and thanks everyone for being online and doing all the fantastic work that you do across the, the state and I think further afield in other states. Uh, and what a wonderful thing we have the technology, which I'll come back to, to kind of gather like this across the country so easily. Uh, and I'll come back just briefly to talk about that. So, uh, of course, at the start, I really want to acknowledge um, the Gaimagal people of the Kringai Nation. That's where I am now, down here in Manly. Uh, and um, then I'd like to just share a story uh, of a young person we see to start off with, to frame some of my thoughts to share with everyone. 
So um, this young person, uh, Wendy, is now around 12 years of age and we met her, so was at Royal Far West, probably what, you know, she's getting towards the, um, um, uh, as she was in kind of mid to late primary. And sadly, uh, well, there's some wonderful things going on for her now, but sadly she illustrates a lot of the, um, well, both protective and what I'd say the risk factors for her neurodevelopment, for her brain development across the lifespan. And always at Royal Far West, we have two key approaches when we think about kids we see. The first one is thinking about their lifespan from even before pregnancy, before they're in the womb, all the way to when we're seeing them now and map that out and all of the strengths, difficulties, protective and risk factors that are um, part of their life. Uh, and then obviously we think about the ecological framework, what's their family structure, community structure, physical, mental health, etc. This young person um, had a family uh, history of ADHD and learning problems, there was inter intergenerational trauma and alcohol use, ended up she, having, she had a genetic condition, which we're not sure if is inherited yet because she's in out of home care, we can't check that. Very difficult pregnancy, small in the womb, uh, lots of uh, potential drug use, alcohol use during the pregnancy. And then unfortunately her early life was very, very traumatic. She's been in stable care for a few years. Um, um, she has connection with her birth family as well, but that's an ongoing challenge with emotional and behavioral and eating problems when she comes back. Um, but unfortunately she's like a lot of the kids we see who um, I suppose in her case got a little bit lost along the way due to her family being under so much stress. And there are obviously lots of points along the way where some early intervention obviously would have been fantastic, uh, obviously to help her family, to help change their trajectory and her trajectory from even before the womb onwards. So I suppose two key things um, to um, take from that is, and where I'm and Royal Far West are thinking a lot is, of course, how can we improve access to care? All of us online know that kids in the bush have problems with access to care. And secondly, how can we change their trajectory? And if we think about Wendy, um, one thing, and thinking about what Jay Weatherall was just saying as well, how can we improve access um, to even early childhood? And of course, technology and telehealth coming back to our Zoom today provides us with a wonderful opportunity to, to beat the tyranny of distance. Now, face-to-face -face is always great and better, but when we can't do that, and one thing COVID's taught us is how we can connect online. And obviously at Royal Far West, we do a lot of our work with kids on telehealth from a young age, engaged them and their parents. We can do assessment, we can do some testing, we can do some therapy. And one good thing again about COVID is it's really upskilled a lot of people in that. Um, and, and so we want to balance our lives with face to face, but that's also a really positive change. We can think to how to be dynamic, creative and innovative in that space, improving access at all the points along from birth onwards, uh, pre, I should say pregnancy onwards. And lastly, on that note, thinking about intervention, I always talk about early, early intervention to change a trajectory. And, and of course, if we can change um, even pregnancies, communities are the next step, but if we can change pregnancies, we can really help set kids up better. Now, obviously there's a lot of work being done in that field. One thing I'm passionate about is trauma and also the effects across Australia, across communities of alcohol exposure. And that's one very important risk factor for developmental problems, which I think as a community across education and health, we could do a better job of supportively informing future parents and current patient parents of any of the risks of alcohol. That's very important, I think, in the bush. It's important in the metro area areas as well. But um, I think that's a conversation we need to continue having to reduce that risk factor for kids development moving forwards. So that's my thoughts and comments. And I'm very interested to hear from everyone else on the panel and in the community today. Thank you. Thanks, Marcel, for your insights. They're really important. And I think, um, you know, it, it does highlight for us a big issue um, in this is, is not about just providing and, and, and getting the access and 
and allowing um, rural families to, to access affordable, good quality childcare. But um, as we've raised earlier, just the benefit, the education um, aspect of this is so important so that families really understand um, that you can actually change a child's trajectory, a trajectory if you get in early enough. So um, thanks for highlighting that, Marcel. Um, I'll pass over now um, to another wonderful friend of ours, um, Councillor Barbara Newton. Um, we've worked with Barbara for a few years now in parks um, and we have very special um, project, uh, early intervention project uh, in parks called the Sprouts Sprouts Project. So Barbara, welcome um, to the roundtable today and, and looking forward to hearing your thoughts. Thank you very much. It's a real pleasure to be here and um, share our experience with, with other people. And I acknowledge that I'm uh, meeting you today from Wiradjuri Nation and I too pay my respects to um, elders past and present and to all Aboriginal people joining us today. Project Sprouts came from a community meeting when we were dis, uh, we heard of the Invisible Children Report. We had a town meeting and from that we started a working party and that working party consists now, it started off at five, it now is seven. So we've been able to work very well with Royal Far West. We were able to get their healthy kids bus stop, come and visit us and look look at our four and five year olds in our whole of Shire, which is the main town of Parks and also our three small villages. And the children in the villages are really the ones that are the most isolated. Um, so it was wonderful to have them being um, assessed. Uh, our main uh, reason for being is to be able to be a conduit. We can't do all the work but we would like to be able to join the children with therapists, with, um, with people to help them and with the families. And as we've done this now for a little while, what we find is the capacity building is just absolutely vital within our efforts to, um, to help these children. I think we all agree that early intervention is something that the society reaps the benefits of long-term. If we don't help these children and these families, it's quite, it's all together there. We, if we don't do that, we know that we're going, these children can um, have problems in the very, very long-term. So we've had our children uh, looked at. We have on our working party, we have early childhood, um, educators, we have a physiotherapist, we have a, a mother who has had children with needing disability and has dealt with Royal Far West. We have an ex-principal and me who's none of those things. So, uh, <laughs> but I just have a very deep interest in it. For an example for us is that when the healthy, we've had the Healthy Kids bus come twice now and this month, this May, I have to read this, um, we had the Healthy Kids bus come and they looked at 87 four to five year olds. And they were from preschool, school referrals and from parents. And they did a total of 248 assessments. Within those assessments, 85 of the 87 children required um, referral. So this is a very high incidence, 85 of those children, and most of them were um, occupational therapy and speech pathology, and we just don't have those services available. We've been to our local health district, um, community health, six to 12 month waiting list. Private practices are very expensive, and a lot of parents we know don't have, just do not have the facility to pay for these services. So we sort of try to find the way that we can help our, our, our families and our children. We've had very good support from local companies. We've had support from council, but the community allied, um, allied health being the key 
is just very, very difficult to get. It's really hard. We have been very fortunate. We're in conversation with Charles Sturt University to do a trial of embedding allied health students in their final year. And with that, we're hoping that that will allow capacity building for the staff and the families, as well as providing therapies for the children. And we see that as a very um, a, a worthwhile uh, venture, and we're hoping to be able to get some funding for these placements through local companies. And of course, we all know how difficult it is to get funding. So that's what Sprouts does. I've probably missed out on a lot of stuff, but it's we we work very hard at um, just seeing our children, helping our children, and helping our families and helping our educators. And I think one of the one of the things that came out of the last visit was that some of the um, practitioners from Royal Far West went into the classroom with very experienced teachers. And those teachers know that children have changed over the last few years and they gained great um, insight and skills. So these are experienced pe people and they got benefit from it. So um, that's what Sprouts is trying to do. And um, so we look forward to, to keep trying. Thank you so much, Barbara. Um, you know, interesting the points Barbara raises. Um, I looked at our, uh, our a number of our Healthy Kids bus stop um, recent visits, which for, for those of you that don't know, is a full developmental screening for three to five year olds. And we normally work in, in partnership with local health districts to do this work. Um, and in the last four that have happened within the last six months, obviously um, prior to COVID, um, the the referral rate for the children that we, we see and we normally see about 80, um, 70 through to 90 kids was a minimum of 85% of kids needing a referral um, to up to 98% of children needing a referral. And for us, that's a really important thing to bring into this, um, this issue, I suppose, is really understanding the rural remote lens here and the fact that what, what this has an impact on is early educators. And although there's pre professional development built into the education system, a lot of these early educators aren't getting access to professional development. And, um, you know, I myself personally, many of our staff have met um, very, very experienced preschool directors that are just giving up the game because it's just too hard. And, you know, for any of you that are on the line that are experiencing that or staff leaving after a long time, um, would love to hear your story today um, when we just wrap up the panel discussion. So look, thank you again, Barbara. Um, really important to hear that. And I just congratulate Parks um, who have really taken the, the bull by the horn, so to speak, and really a driving change for themselves, for the community, um, for the children of Parks. Um, so finally, our last panelist, um, I'd like to introduce Karen Russell, who joins us from the Smith family today. Karen is the National Manager for Early Years and Government Programs, and uh, she's going to be talking to us about small steps and big futures. So um, thanks for joining us, Karen. Thanks so much, Jackie. And can I uh, echo your congratulations um, to Barbara and the Sprouts project? Um, I, Whenever I hear Jay speaking about um, the Thrive by Five campaign, I sit back here kind of saying, can I hear an amen? Because the, the system as it's currently constructed is so complex. It is so difficult for parents to, ma uh, to navigate. And um, into this, the Commonwealth um, invited the Smith family to do uh, some work to identify what would help families living in circumstances of disadvantage or vulnerability to engage with and participate fully in the preschool sector. Of course, this was, you know, sitting underneath their responsibilities um, under the Universal Access National Partnership for um, Children's Access to Preschool. I could talk about this for hours and I don't have hours. So I'm going to try to distill it um, to just a few points. Firstly, um, 
the system as it's constructed appears to be constructed to serve itself rather than to serve the needs of families and communities. And what we found as we went through our work was that the best way to try to deconstruct the problems that we were identifying was to take um, a human-centered design approach. So put the family and the community at the center of the issue and engage with those people to develop the solutions, the local solutions that would work for them. Um, in regional New South Wales, we, we spent time in both Dubbo and um, Wellington uh, and, you know, just reflecting on some of the conversation we we're having before this meeting, this was during COVID times and uh, I am coming to you from the beautiful lands of the Gadigal people of the Eora the Eor Nation deep in the heart of Sydney. We did not want to take COVID into Dubbo or Wellington. So our work had to be done by Zoom, which um, uh, trying to do human-centered design by Zoom is, is not the easiest thing. We found that the communities have extraordinary strengths that can be built upon, but those strengths are too frequently ignored by the system. And it really does take local effort, um, local work to bring together the assets of the local community and to identify the specific challenges that that, 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 that community has. Um, so I guess, you know, again, just to keep this really, um, really simple, our, our, our um, findings were that we recommend that any intervention that is designed, it needs to be designed with the human at the center rather than the system at the center. Because as I say, that system is currently serving itself rather than the people that it should be serving. We've got to adopt a family focused approach. We've got to have greater responsiveness to family needs. And we've got to enhance the connections between government sectors because families don't understand how health and education operate separately and communities and justice operate separately in their different silos. And yet they all have something to say about childhood development and they all have something to offer communities around childhood development. And finally, we've got to involve local people in local solutions. I know that sounds very glib, very cliche, but it, unless we can unpack the current system, get rid of it as um, Jay's big ambition um, would, would lead us, and I, I'm right there with you, Jay, but until we get there, that's, that's the only way we're going to be able to deal with this issue. I'll leave it there. I've got, I, yeah, I'll leave it there. Thanks, Karen. That's great. Well, look, um, thank you, panellists. I'm going to open it up for questions now. Um, and uh, there's some great questions coming through. Um, I might start with a question from Ben Bradley. And, and maybe this is one for Marcel, but anyone from the any one of the panellists um, could answer this one. Uh, ben says, isn't one block both for parents and professionals to people accessing childcare for infants is the belief that babies aren't suited for out of home care? Recent research being road tested in Dubbo childcare centres um, shows babies are born capable of and enjoy genuine group level interaction, which makes childcare a boon right from the early months on. Does anyone want to address that one? I can if nobody else wants to, Jackie. <laughs> I mean, I think that universal platform is a really crucial idea. The idea that you don't you don't have a sort of residualized targeted system, but you have a universal platform from which more targeted services can then um, form. And I mean, if you speak to sort of health professionals, they'll tell you that there's quite a lot of rather than this medical model where it's diagnosis, referral, waiting list. There's there's quite a lot that can be done through properly trained. Um, early childhood development professionals, however you want to call them, whether they're, and we've got all these hats we wear, whether it's nursing, social work or teaching, but 
you know, children are just one thing. They're just, it's just their healthy development. And if, if people were able to, to be given the, the knowledge, that shared knowledge base can be the thing that sews together all these service systems. So I think, you know, there are lots of different moving parts to this, but I think one is a universal platform, then a shared knowledge base, and then try and do as much as you can within those, uh, those services. Of course, there'll need to be specialist referrals on occasions, but, you know, having a child waiting for three years uh, on a waiting list is somewhat absurd, especially when, you know, the developmental opportunity has sort of been, has, has passed. Mm. Thanks, Jay. Um, I've got another one from Sue Tape, um, perhaps for you, Karen. Has the rollout of NDIS been of benefit for young children in rural and remote areas or another example of government services designed without consideration of challenges in the bush? And um, Karen, would love for you to address that one. We have some views on that too at Royal Far West. Um, I think that... Um the rollout of the NDIS is still fraught with problems all over. Um, the issues are evident in the bush. They're also evident in metropolitan areas. Um, yeah, I have, it's a, it's a fantastic um, reform, a much needed initiative, but the teething problems I think are going to take a number of years to, to resolve. The, the issue of availability of services and, um, the market needing to respond to the, um, uh, the needs of people in rural and remote locations is particularly fraught. Uh, and that appears to be what the NDIS is leaning on. Can I say for Sprouts, we don't deal with NDIS children because the NDIS is there for them. And that's one of a lot of, the therapists we need, uh, there's so few of them, their time is taken up with NDIS, uh, uh, rightly so, but it just means these children are just pushed back that little bit further. Yeah, I, there's another comment here. In our system, the only access to community OTs or speech is if the child has an NDIS plan or private therapy. How is this equitable? Um, from Erica, I mean, look, we we are picking up a lot of those children that don't um, that aren't covered by NDIS at Royal Far West, um, and absolutely, it's it's not equitable when um, those children uh, often have as uh, severe challenges to um, you know their healthy development. And Marcel, I saw you um, were nodding your head if you wanted to jump in there. Oh, I was just going to reiterate what Barbara was saying. There are those kids who fall through the gaps um, for a whole range of reasons, but one can be their profile, whether from diagnosis or functionality, doesn't seem to quite fit the NDIS, and that can be really tricky, obviously, for everyone involved. Um, and that's where those, um, um, going back, I suppose, to Jay's point about, um, um, if you like, uni uniform, universal supports are so important. Um, which obviously comes back to investing in early childhood education in the public health system so that those kids can access those. Many of you would know in the New South Wales health facilities in the bush, the wait lists are particularly long um, for, you know, for speech or OT for these kids. So, I mean, I, I totally agree with what everyone's saying and it's a real challenge as the NDIS moves forward to become more dynamic, capture those kids who are functionally impaired and that functionality may be, of course, their rural, rural, uh, rural living, if you like, um, and how they're actually going to access things. Uh, but I think the voices here today will help push that forward. Thanks, Marcel. And look, there's great, um, there's great comments coming through on the chat as well. I would really love to hear from um, one of our uh, early educators that might be on the line, um, perhaps to share their story, because all of these issues are placing a lot of extra stress on our early educators. And, you know, I think that that is, um, it's, it's a really exacerbated situation in the bush. Um, would anyone like to perhaps raise their hand or so we can take you off mute? Leonie? If we could uh, unmute Leonie Arnold, that would be great. Alice, are we able to do that? Oh, there we go. Um, yes, 
So with um, NDIS, when it first started in Bundaberg, um, it was brilliant. It worked, was working really well. But the growing waiting lists, now we have, a, they're calling it catastrophic waiting lists. So um, we do use Welfare West Telehealth. So that's fixed, you know, that's stepped in to fill a gap, which has been amazing. Um, but can, even now, we've only got one paediatrician in town and he's got, he's triaging his wait lists. Um, so this is having, and, and, and the other issue probably Jay knows about is the inclusion support is such a complex system um, for us to try and, and um, gain an extra staff member while we have multiple children in a room that have ongoing needs. Um, that's, that's providing um, the perfect storm for staffing issues, that staff are getting tired of you know, waiting months and months to get either funding or access um, for children. It's just very um, wearing. So, um, I mean, we're pretty lucky. Our staff are long-term and they're quite experienced, but um, we're noticing that, that the staffing shortages are starting to really hit um, and hit hard. Um, so, you know, there's multiple um, issues right across from wages to access to our health services, um, to qualified staffing. And of course the CCS is just not working for anyone. And um, that was evident through that fee-free period. Um, and the, 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 the difference it made for families that, you know, we were still working and they could um, access um, how many hours they needed. We had children coming in extra days. Their development went through the roof. And, you know, it was good. We knew that. But to see that, observe that in that such a short time, the difference was amazing. So we, the, we, um, our network group does advocate. We've had many meetings with our federal manager, um, member Keith Pitt, um, state manager, yeah, federal members to try and get some change because it's, it's going to be in the next year or two really telling because no one knows how many no no one knows how many children are not accessing childcare now because there's no numbers kept on that. So it's just going to get worse over the next couple of years. Thanks, Leonie. And we have some data around that um, uh, which shows that there's definitely lower rates of participation in mm. rural and remote areas. Um, thanks, Leonie, for sharing. Um, Tamara, um, Tamara's from CSU, another one of our great friends. Um, uh, Tamara, um, you've got a comment to make? Thank you so much, Jackie. And it's just been so inspiring to hear all of the ideas that have been circulating at today's round table. And, I guess what I wanted to say is to talk about what's good about our early learning system and also to say that I think this is a really important time um, from which all of us can um, move forward. So I'd first like to say that regardless of whether it's preschools or long daycare services, the, the early learning system um, uh, under the early years learning framework has been in place now for more years and our national quality standard has lifted the standard massively of a lot of services, but it's disproportionately um, not working for um, the kinds of areas that we're all so concerned with. Um, but what I'd, I'd like to say is that I, I feel hopeful because we've got um, a national workforce strategy coming, part of which is more attention to educators' wellbeing, which has been so badly affected in the past two years in particular, but also because it's going to improve data collection. Um, I think we've got a very strong base and I think it's important to recognise that and to see that this is a this is a great time. I think, you know, with so many things, I'm a big fan of Royal Far West. Um, it's a really great time to be moving forward on the initiatives. And thanks very much for the opportunity today, Jackie. Thanks, Tamara. Um, and Doreen, um, you've had your hand up as well. Doreen's from the Educational Leaders Association. Doreen? Thank you, and um, congratulations on hosting this event. I think this is a critical discussion. Educational leaders, there's one in every early learning centre, and they are the people who are in charge of the quality of the program. So they are pretty critical people to have in each and every early learning centre to attract good people, great qualifications, to keep them there, improving on their qualifications, 
and stopping them from going is critical. The survey that came out yesterday from Big Steps, and you can search for it online, tells us that 37% of New South Wales educators told the survey that they intend to leave the sector. A shocking 68% of those who intend to leave the sector within, do intend to leave the sector within the next three years. An alarming 50% of educators upskilling to a master's and 34% upskilling to early childhood teachers are doing so with the intention of leaving the sector in the long term. The main reason is workload, which is being worked on in the workforce study, but it is still a massive issue. And it is low pay. The parents in every centre have never not supported the idea of educators being better paid. The support for that is huge, but parents can't pay for it. And they don't have to in the schooling system. The schooling system is managed in a very appropriate way for it. What is needed is a comparable system so that these wages can actually be paid. The, last, the first time I heard early childhood educators being promised a review and a good look at what their wage needs were was when Bob Hawke was in power. And it's been happening on a regular basis, year in, year out since then. Major systemic change is needed to refund the system so that we can pay these wages. I visit between five and 20 centres a week. And I'm in contact with rural and regional services right across the country. And it is no different. They may love your community and they may love working for you but they're paying a hefty price and we're not gonna keep them in the long term if we don't address these issues. Your discussions today and the multidisciplinary approaches I've heard about today and in the chat seeing support for educators and the recognition that educators really are suffering because there aren't enough allied health around, for example, just shows that everybody's here with a will. I think we just have to find the way. Thanks for the opportunity to chat. Thanks, Doreen. Great way to finish off your comments. Um, Deborah, can we unmute Deborah? As, as we're doing that, I just want to um, point out that one of our, um, just trying to find it, Jane from Tathra Preschool, we work with Tathra Preschool in our bushfire recovery program, um, just makes a comment that free preschool with COVID payments has had an enormous impact on access to early childhood education prior to school. And I think we've got to keep that in mind. It's, it's been a COVID's taught us a few things, hasn't it? Um, Deborah, thank you. Thank you very much for the opportunity to, to speak. And I would like to acknowledge the Butterjee people from further west than where I am, which is where I am west of Burke. Further west from where I am is the Paru and on the Paru, there is a little village called uh, Wanaring, and um, that's the home. The Paru is the home of the Butterjee people. I'd like to acknowledge them, um, uh, all the uh, past, present, and future inhabitants of that area. I'm mentioning Wanaring because Wanaring was one of the first um, small schools that we targeted as ICPA, New South Wales, targeted to advocate for preschooling um, to be established there. And it's a good example, and I, I am aware of the time, I'll just be quick. We've since um, identified up to 15 other places that are in the same boat. So just to uh, inform the panel that if you uh, live remotely, your access to preschool is by distance education. And most children who, uh, who have access to a parent or a tutor or a governess to do that uh, uh, excel in their primary years because they've had that preschooling advantage if you are a child who is either out on a station or in a remote village and for whatever reason do not have access to somewhere, somewhere and someone to deliver that distance education preschool, you do not have preschool access, which was mandated um, in 2008. So yes, from 2014 until now, we have been very, very actively asking for this. 
and there have been many different solutions um, proposed. And right now, we're 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 still one school has been established um, and is currently not working because there aren't the students. What we originally wanted was one that would pop up and pop down. So, so because of the huge volatility of the numbers. So just to be very brief and, um, and in accordance with what I've heard here this afternoon, which has been so inspiring to have a room of all like-minded people, it's just done me so much good. But uh, ICPA New South Wales would very strongly like to, to, to agree that, uh, as I think Jay Weatherall mentioned, that technology is, is not the best way to uh, teach children and be in their lives, but it's better than nothing. And currently they have nothing. So we would like these small isolated villages to have, as they do in Queensland, very sensibly, uh, Education Queensland has established e-kindy, which is their preschool, and they have a, a certificate three diploma or, and now it's required that they be, have a diploma in education, educator there on the ground with them, and they get their distance education packs, and they are all are actually at the school doing those packs. And I just really wanted to um, take the chance to tell all the people that are here today, as you're all so passionate, our problem, and that's our problem. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Deborah. Um, we're going to have to wrap it up now. I would like to just thank all of our pan panelists. Um, uh, Minister Mitchell, thank you so much. Um, CEO Thrive by Five, Jay Weatherill, Russell, um, and Karen Russell, and of course, Barbara Newton. Um, thank you so much for joining us. It, it really has, I think, highlighted um, what we know and we experience every day at Royal Far West that there are much more complex issues um, to be considered in rural and remote areas um, and, and it can't be a one size fits all. And we will continue um, you know, to drive that rural and remote lens to this really important um, issue. So thanks again, everyone. Um, if there's interest, we would love to host something like this again. Um, and uh, hopefully we've made some, some more progress by then. And I've no doubt we will under this um, you know, campaign that's really growing momentum um, every day. So um, thanks again, everyone. Um, great comments uh, in the chat and we'll take on board all of those uh, questions and, and feed them back into the Thrive by Five group. Thank you.